anyway, the, 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 the size and shape of the earth does play into a number of important things and has to be considered when we're thinking in terms of the changing planet. Because you see the idea that, that, the, that the Arctic Circle is where it is and, has, has, and, and compared to the center of mass of the Great Laurentide Ice Sheet, which was centered over Hudson Bay. And a lot of the Arctic Ocean was actually clear during the, the late glacial maximum, which is pretty bizarre when you think about it. And, and uh, Western Alaska was, for the most part, not glaciated. Large parts of Siberia were not glaciated. The entire glacier mass would have been shifted off of the North Pole in this bizarre way. Also interesting, if you take the Arctic Circle and the size of the Arctic Circle, and it were you to move the combined Laurentide and Cordillera and ice sheets up to f into the Arctic Circle, it would pretty much fill the Arctic Circle very nicely, see? So this has led people like Charles Hapgood to speculate, and others, to speculate that there was some kind of a pole shift. Now, earlier, Emmanuel Velikovsky th uh, theorized a pole shift, but he was looking at the, the whole axis of the Earth shifting, which could only happen under the most extreme and extraordinary circumstances. And, and uh, I don't really believe that model. I don't believe this model. Um, Charles Hapgood's model was a, more, a little more sophisticated in that he saw sort of episodes of accelerated plate tectonics where this movement could get accelerated. And if that movement is accelerated, it, it, it could lead us to uh, conjecture how much of that movement could occur and what would be driving it, see? And I think that, again, we have to look at this, this iso isostatic adjustment that's going on because if you have a major deglaciation and you have sections of, some sections of the earth rising by two or 3,000 feet, other sections of the earth depressing by two or 3,000 feet, now what's happening is because as the planet is spinning, it, it's essentially a plastic mass. So it, it's, its mass is going to be trying to distribute itself according to the sum total of these, these centrifugal and gravitational forces working on it as it's rotating. It never gets there, never gets to equilibrium, but that's what it's trying to do, see? So now you have this major glacier, glaciation and deglaciation episode. So now you've got this enormous mass transfer over the surface of the Earth. What does this do, not only to the stability of the Earth's uh, orbit, uh, or rather uh, rotation, not its orbit, its rotation, or the uh, the process of plate tectonics. So if you have a deglaciation and part of the continent rises, what has happened there? See, it's like, you have to think of it this way. If, you, if you're essentially, if you're going from the, la from the equator to the North Pole, or vice versa from an equator to the South Pole, you're basically going downhill, right? If you're going from the, from the, uh, the pole to the, towards the equator, you're going uphill and you're going to have climbed a 13 mile hill to get there, see? So now you move one of the plates 2,000 or 3,000 feet away from where it would want it to be given its latitude. Does that set up an impelling force that would cause that plate to want to move, to migrate to where, to a latitude that would be actually consistent with its distance from the Earth's center of mass. You see what I'm getting at? Yes, I do, yeah. I'm having a hard time explaining that. But <laughs> so what I'm getting at is, is does this, this motion accelerate this motion? Right. And once this motion gets underway, I mean, can it play out? See, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as Hap, like Hapgood did to think that that motion would be something that would happen overnight. I would think it would be more over a period of three or four or 5,000 years. And in fact, this could still be going on. And this may be one of the reasons why the magnetic pole is, is oscillating still around the pole of rotation, which it's doing. See, it, the planet is probably not returned to stability after the, 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 you know, the chaotic events of the, of the transition of the Younger Dryas. It's probably still moving there. And I, we may even go so far as to say that some of the volcanism and the seismicity that we're seeing now still could be dissipating aftershocks because that's how extreme those changes were 11, 12, 13,000 years ago. Yeah. I was going to say, like, in line with that, the, 
the, the isostasy motion, uh, especially how drastic it is at the very beginning. If you know, if you have a catastrophic yeah. melting, uh, then the uh, initial isostasy is going to be drastic, right? It's going to move quickly and then it eventually s- slows down, uh, right? Yeah. That, that quick uh, isostatic up and down vertical movement of those plates may actually change the plasticity of the low velocity zone in the upper asthenosphere and allow sliding to happen better. Yes. But, uh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, that's certainly, yes, there, there's nothing implausible about that, yeah. I would say, I would think. Yeah, so, so it could be that there was, so uh, pole shift, what do we mean by that? Maybe Hapgood's idea of, of, a, of a, a, he was looking at the entire right. outer shell of the earth, basically loosening at the, at the asthenosphere level and sliding over the mantle. I don't think we have to go that far and we don't have to go as quick as he did. But I think his basic idea of accelerated plate tectonics may certainly be feasible and could explain. I mean, he was seeing that that, that was what could have been driving uh, periods of uh, orogenesis. Do you know what I mean by that? Orogenesis. Orogenesis. Orogenesis is just the process of mountain building, like yeah. Brad said. And mountain building is generally considered to be a very slow process because it's being driven by continental drift, right? So continental drift is that the, you have spreading centers. And this goes back to what, you know, we've been focusing on for the last uh, uh, four or five episodes in, in our discussion of Atlantis. We've had to look somewhat at the geology of, of the Atlantic Ocean. And we have that, uh, the mid-Atlantic spreading uh, center right there. We've got the plates moving away from there. We've got uh, magma upwelling flowing outwards, uh, solidifying as it moves outwards. And so what we see is that the youngest lavas are closest to the center of the fracture, the, the big fault line, runs up right through the, through the cuts, slices off a big chunk of the Azores Plateau, which is now several thousand feet under the surface of the sea. But so we've been looking at that, the, the, um, the plate spreading and where was I going with that? I guess that was it. Yeah. Mountain building. I was going to yeah, ask. Right, right. Okay. So the, the process, assuming that it's a few centimeters per year, basically a very slow process, right. which, you know, suppose within this new model that we're talking about here, what we're looking at now, when we measure modern rates, maybe we're only looking at residual rates. Maybe, maybe there are periods of time when those rates accelerate. and to, to determine that, I mean, we'd have to have a very precise set, uh, dating of a lot of the, the lavas that came out. And you, because as you get away from, the, from the, uh, the fracture line, the fracture zone there, you're, you're getting more and more, you're getting older, right? Because those are older lavas. But the other side of it is that in places where you've got spreading, in other places, the plates are colliding, right? So what happens when the plates collide? Well, there you can have uplift, right? Or you can have, you can have overthrusting like this, which you see a lot of those incredible overthrust mountains up there in the Canadian Rockies, um, where one big slab it might be three thousand foot thick slab of rock slides over another one, and you can see it just built up there, um, one on top of the other, and you can see the strata in the rock are, are actually tilted, almost like the it, the crust the lithosphere broke and then buckled up, right? Now the assumptions are that mountain building can be no, really no faster than continental drift. So that mountains are only rising at a few centimeters per year, if that. But one reason I think we could perhaps question that is when we look at the status of a lot of the mountains, you know, particularly the Rocky Mountains, the ones I've spent the most time in, but the Sierras, um, you could look at the Andes. I spent a fair amount of time in the Pyrenees Mountains. You see those, it's the Alps. same thing there. I haven't been to the Alps, no. I'm heading there in the morning, but. Um, okay, <laughs> let us know, give us a report. <laughs> I'll give you a report. No, but you'll definitely find the same thing there. That whole, um, that whole belt of, of mountains that in, basically goes from the Alps over to the Himalayas. That's all, and, in fact, the Pyrenees is part of that fold in the, in the crust. Well, here's the thing, as, as, as the, uh, the fold, as the mountain range is rising, basically the higher it gets, the faster the erosional processes are that, that 
that affect it and want to eat, basically eat it away as it's as it's rising you see so what happens is you know again when we're talking about the planet trying to reach equilibrium you've got high places and you've got low places it's the the transition or the transport of material is obviously taking place from the high highlands the high areas to the low areas and so what what is happening is in part of this geomorphic equilibrium that the planet is is striving for is this you know this will go down it, the material will fill up and pretty soon you would have what geologists of old referred to as a peneplain where basically you've just everything is pretty flat and and that's what would happen if you had uh if you took away all of these plate tectonic processes and and you would have very shallow seas spread over a large part of the earth more so than now and the parts every you'd, the, you'd have shallow sea bottoms and you'd have you know, land masses that had been weathered away down almost to sea level, right? There have actually been times in Earth history where it appears that was kind of the prevailing condition. But when we look at the landscape, we're not seeing that. We're seeing, you know, when you travel through the Western states, you're seeing these tremendous eight, nine, ten thousand foot layers of rock that may have been taken millions of years to accumulate, right? But how long did it take them to uplift? See, there's the question. I think that we should be considering that there might be periods of accelerated plate tectonics and periods of accelerated mountain building because basically it comes down to this. And, and we should actually devote a, 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 an episode to this when we start. We can look at these processes of weathering in great detail. How how carbonate rocks like limestone weather as compared to say granitic rocks and what happens, what happens with the, with the freeze thaw cycle when, when once the, the, the elevation gets high enough that it could, becomes perpetually cold. Now you have, or, or you have, you know, the colder seasonal cycle going to work. Now you can get really rapid weathering away of, of the rocks. Also vegetation, anybody who's been out hiking can see, you know, trees growing out of, uh, cracks in rocks and the roots of the trees going in caught splitting the rocks huge boulders might be split or bedrock might be split by the and then you add in seismic activity which we know happens all over the world um varying degrees obviously some places are more susceptible than others but so, so what i'm getting at here is that after this long rant is that the uplifting may sometimes occur much faster because the rates of weathering are actually and see that's it when you go and you look at you study the you you, you look at the, the the studies on weathering rates and how quickly mountain ranges are wore down basically what would happen is if if you didn't have anything countering this effect and you only had the weathering somewhere between 10 and 20 or 30 million years we're down to sea level. We've eroded down because, you know, so here's the thing. If, if everything is only moving at the rate of modern C4 sp spreading, that means mountains are only uplifting at the rate of a centimeter or two a year. But if that's the case, then the uplift is really no faster than the, the wearing down of the weathering processes. You see, that's what I'm getting at. After all of this, that's what I'm trying to get at is that the uplifting processes must be a lot quicker than the, the wearing down processes to end up with, with the mountain ranges that we see in the world today. Right. Or, or and, you'd end up with that peneplain. Or you'd end up with that peneplain, right. I, you look at the Rockies and then you look at the Appalachians and you can see, to me, it seems like the Rockies are, are pointy and sharp, jagged. Yeah. Very. Well, they're much, much younger, obviously. So, very much uh, younger. but but, the, but the Appalachians were once the scale of the Himalayas. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just I'm just saying that it seems like you with a lot with millions of years of weathering, you shouldn't have sharp, jagged, blocky looking. Right. right? And 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 that's the thing too. The weathering is always going to attack the sharper corners, the angular edges first and mm -hmm. what it's going to be doing is it's going to start and it's going to be rounding those off right. and it'll continue to round and and what you're going to end up with is is a very different look and you can see places where it looks like that but you also see places where man it looks like it got broken you know 
a few centuries ago. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so fresh looking. And then, you know, you get to the, um, you know, the erosion, erosional features in the southwest, like Mo Monument Valley. And you have these pinnacle rocks, excuse me, that are, you know, st tall, skinny rocks, you know, that is, that is uh, friable sandstone. And how long have they been there? I mean, we know that th those areas around there have had seismic activity. There's all kinds of evidence of volcanism up there north of Flagstaff. So there's been, definitely been tectonic activity. How much tectonic activity would it take to topple these fragile spires of rock that you see in the Garden of the Gods or the Valley of the Gods and, the, uh, and Monument Valley and places like that? Right. Not much, it seems like. Yeah. Not much, no. That that's the thing. So so then you then you have to say, well, is that an implication that these things are not really that old? Mm -hmm.